Welcome to uh, the Trouble with Truth. Uh, we live in a divisive and divided world, and no doubt many are a bit troubled about that, thinking, how do we overcome this? And there are many people who have seen the divisiveness as a consequence of a bigger philosophical shift, an attack on objective truth, uh, which many put at the door of postmodernism and some incomprehensible French intellectuals. <laughs> now, we've got to take this uh, seriously. I mean, there are a lot of different people who have this view. So amongst philosophy uh, in the English-speaking world, analytic philosophers are often philosophical realists, and they, they tend to take the same sort of view as Roger Scruton. Here he said, postmodernists have for decades been responsible for undermining morality, culture, values, and most importantly, the idea of truth. Uh, he's not alone. Uh, Pope Benedict, the, uh, the man who resigned as the papacy in 2013, you remember, very unusual first person in six or 700 years to do so. He said, when you deny the opportunity for people to refer to an objective truth, dialogue is rendered impossible and violence, whether declared or hidden, becomes the rule of law of human relationships. And Liz Truss, recently promoted to foreign secretary at the top of the British government, when she was pointing out what she thought were excesses in the focus on sexism and racism in comprehensive education, put the, put the blame at the door of postmodernism, saying postmodernism has no space for evidence because truth and morality are seen as relative. And on the other side of the political spectrum, the Marxist theorist Frederick Jameson said postmodernism post is the cultural logic of late capitalism and he wasn't intending to be polite. We should therefore take notice. There are many people who would see this attack on truth as being an attack on the very central aspects of our culture, a culture which has been built, an enlightenment culture which has been built on the idea of progress and knowledge and discovering things. And the attack on objective truth seems to undermine um, all of that. And I have sympathy for that. I've been engaged with the puzzle about truth, and as we'll see, it's a deep one throughout my philosophical career. And when I started <laughs> rather laughably as a, as a student, I can remember I had a, a renowned social theorist as a tutor called Stephen Lukes, and he'd written about relativism. And I began uh, farcically saying to him, I want to use this term to get to the bottom of the bedrock of knowledge. I want to find the foundation. And he rather kindly uh, indulged my naivety. But he had the last laugh because the more I tried to find a bedrock for knowledge, the more I uncovered our inability to do so. And the first sign that there's something problematic about this attachment to objective truth is that these folk who are critical of objective truth don't seem to be able to agree on what they think it is. Analytic philosophers tend to hold a scientistic view of the world. They think that science goes along with truth. We gradually discover what's going on. And they certainly don't have the same version of objective truth as Pope Benedict. And the same is true of the politicians we've seen. I mean, Liz Truss doesn't really have very much to do with the sort of views that uh, Jameson is going to hold. In fact, your start of a 10, what do they agree on? So there's something a bit puzzling about this assertion of objective truth. And and it begins to look as if the assertion of objective truth is not based on some you know, observation of the evidence. It's just a desire to say, I'm right, and I don't want there to be any further conversation about it. So I'm not saying that denying objective truth isn't dangerous. I think it can be. If we are critical of objective truth and we say, well, everyone can have their own view, and we just have a multitude, a plenitude of alternative ways of understanding the world, 
that's potentially really problematic if all we get is anarchic chaos and nobody can agree on how they might solve these disputes between them. So how are we to escape from this maze that we found ourselves in? Situation where we've somehow recognized the perspectival character of truth, but on the other hand, we don't want the consequences. Well, in order to extricate ourselves from this maze, I think we first of all got to understand a little bit about how we got here. And we could start with um, Kant, who was the first person who, well, not quite the first person, but he was one of the first people to point to the importance of concepts in determining how we understand the world and how we make sense of it in terms of our experience. But I'm going to jump forward to someone who came much later, at the end of the 19th century, uh, in a book called The Golden Bough, by Fraser's Golden Bough, as it's often referred to. And this was a remarkable book. Uh, it was published in 1890, and it caused a furore. And the reason that it did was because it was a work of comparative mythology and religion. And so Fraser had gone, gone round and he collected all of the different views and beliefs across hundreds of uh, cultures and tribes around the world. And he just put them one next to the other. And uh, he'd included, just for measure, as one of them, Christianity. That really sent people off the deep end. Because it looked as if, how could any one of these be true? There are just hundreds of them, all different, one after the other. So why should we think that any of one of these could be, could be true? And so the, the contextual, perspectival uh, uh, genie was out of the bottle. And so what began as a recognition of just the, the contextual character of religious and mythological belief became a recognition of the contextual character of moral uh, belief and of our social organization. And it didn't stop there. We then, the early 20th century, became more and more aware of the significance of language. Up until then, there'd been the idea somehow language is sort of transparent. You have an idea, you use language to talk about it, it's all very straightforward. And then, the early part of the 20th century, that changed and we became more and more aware that the very way that language is used and the concepts we use changes how we understand it. So the context is not just a historical context or a social context or a cultural context. We've also got the context of language. And there was a further move. Post-war, the last nuggets of solidity became under attack. And researchers looking at the way that science functioned, looking at the way that we form our theories, came to the conclusion that the facts don't just lie out there ready for the scientists to discover them. Instead, the facts that they identify are partly a function of the theory that they hold in the first place. So facts became theory dependent. That sort of brings us up to a point where postmodernism comes onto the scene. And as you can see, postmodernism isn't really the big story here. The, the, the trajectory was all in place. And that trajectory of recognizing the, the importance and significance of context to our beliefs was driven by good enlightenment values, like observing how we did things, going to research how we generated our, our theories. And it led us to a situation of uh, concluding that knowledge is perspectival. So all of that development is not something that comes from outside the tradition. 
we can't think that these, this attack on objective truth is just from sort of troublemakers who want to sort of pull things down and, uh, and, and get rid of the institutions we've gone at the moment. It's come from inside the institution. It's come from inside the Enlightenment. It's come from those very principles that led us to develop knowledge in the first place. The attack on knowledge comes from uh, a recognition of the way in which knowledge is acquired. So there we are, back to the maze, the contemporary predicament. We, on the one hand, are, have led ourselves to realize that our, our beliefs are contextual, but we don't like the outcome. We don't like the idea that there's no way of communicating. And furthermore, there's an additional twist, which is there's a self-referential paradox in that contemporary position. So if you say, well, knowledge is perspectival, is the view that knowledge is perspectival perspectival? And if it is, well, what the hell are we saying? Um, uh, the, the, the more classic example of this is to say there is no truth. So many people want to say there is no truth these days, but is it true that there is no truth? <laughs> or is it just not true that there's no truth? So there's a self-referential problem in expressing that contemporary view. So it is deeply problematic. What are we going to do about it? And I certainly don't think we can stay here. Now, when I first came across this problem, I thought that the key figures in philosophy, in the British tradition, Wittgenstein, and in the continental tradition, Derrida, were very much enmeshed in that paradox. So the, the, they had radical consequences for their story of the world. Wittgenstein came to the view that he could make no overall comment about the nature of ourselves and the world at all. It's just over. We can't do that for this reason, that you can't state it. So we've all heard of deconstruction, became rather fashionable. Uh, but Derrida had to deconstruct deconstruction. You can't just wheel on deconstruction. You've got to deconstruct it as well. And Derrida was well aware of this problem. And his whole philosophy is an endless circling and abandoning of what he's just said. That seemed to me like just not a very credible way of going on. And at the outset, when I, I sort of were encountered this puzzle, this deep predicament, I, like them, became obsessed with the structure of that self-reference. And the, the, I wrote, a, wrote a, a book about it, which was called, indeed, Reflexivity, the Postmodern Predicament. But then, it occurred to me that maybe there is a way out. And the idea, at first, seems absurd that maybe our ideas and theories of the world don't describe what's out there. That's not what they're doing. They're not descriptions of some ultimate reality at all. And furthermore, in some sense, they've got no connection with what's out there. I told you it seemed absurd. So I thought, I started with this thought, OK, maybe there's no connection. And of course, I thought, as you do, no doubt thinking about that, that, how can that possibly work? How could it possibly be the case that our accounts of the world have got no connection with what's actually out there? But then, the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me we can give a very good account of why, even though there is no connection between our theories and the world, that they can work. So. I'm going to give you a metaphor. Our senses, I want you to think as flags in the wind. They're not discovering what's out there. They're responding. They're blowing in various ways in response to all of the stuff out there. And I'm not an idealist. I don't think it all happens in our head. I think there, you know, there is stuff out there. I just don't think it's like the way we think. So our senses are flags in the wind. And it doesn't matter how much you look at the flags, 
if you've never come across the wind, you're never going to be able to identify what it's like. It's just something else. And imagine you were in an underground bunker and you'd had no contact with the world and all you had was a picture of these flags blowing in the wind. You might be able to identify patterns in the flags. And you might, as a result of that, if you had a robotic arm or something, change what the robotic arm did out there based on the flags. You couldn't see the wind, of course, but you'd see the flags. And you might be able to intervene. But you'd never understand what the wind was, would you? You just got the flags. So I think that's what's going on at every level of our brain processes, if you like. And when a neuron fires, it's like a flag in the wind. It's got the whole of the universe out there, and it's waving, and occasionally it fires. So it takes all of the universe, and it's got one response. It either fires or it doesn't fire. That's all it does. We don't think of when the neuron fires as a description of the world, do we? We don't think somehow the firing of the neuron describes what's going on out there. Well, it's obviously not. It's a response to the world. And that's just the first layer. All of those flags in the wind blowing and firing. And then the next layer is when we put all of these different ones firing together and we hold them as, say, a patch of blue or an edge. And that patch of blue or the edge isn't out there in the world either. Of course it isn't. It's a response. It's our response to the stuff out there. And the same then is true of our thoughts. Our thoughts are ways of holding different inputs from one, sensation, one sense with another. I can think of this as a table. I hold the, the flags blowing visually with the ones that happen when I feel it. They're quite different things. They're utterly different things. There's no connection between the feel and the visual sensation that I'm getting from, from the visual side of things. And I hold both of those together with the idea table. And we imagine there is a table out there. But it's the same game. It's a way of holding the world which enables us to intervene, but is not a description. That's not what's going on. Now, one way of thinking about that then is our thoughts and our sensations are tools. They're tools to help us intervene in the world. They're not descriptions. And just like any other tool, a pen, a pen can be useful, it can be nice to hold. It can be effective. It can be easy to write with or not easy to write with. It can be better or worse. But you can't have a true pen, can you? That doesn't make any sense. You have a useful pen. You have one that doesn't smudge. You have a, a pen that's useful for certain things. You can have it as an aesthetic object. You can have all, But you don't have a true pen. And that's what's going on with our theories and accounts of the world. They are tools to help us intervene. So let me give you a specific example of that, which might help you realize just how powerful our ways of holding the world, which I would describe as closures. And I describe them as closures because the vocabulary that I would offer you is that we think of the world as being open and we close it. And we close it through all of these uh, specific ways of responding. Now, an example of how that actually works, because you might still feel quite skeptical about this, is when you look up at the stars, you can see all sorts of patterns, can't you? We're used to ones like Orion, Cassiopeia. Those astronomers amongst you will be able to pick out Hercules. But we don't think those patterns are the ultimate ones. Other cultures have completely different patterns that they find in the sky. And not surprising, 
because in just 100 stars, you can make more patterns than there are atoms in the known universe. That's really the case. You can make more patterns out of 100 stars than there are atoms in the known universe. So in the sky, it is an inconceivably large number of patterns. And when you look up, you just choose one. Oh, I can see Orion. But that's one out of billions and billions and billions and billions of possible ways of holding the stars. So we don't remotely think that any of those are true, do we? I mean, do we? I mean, they're just different ways of looking at, at stuff out there. But that doesn't mean to say they're not useful. When you've, when you've spotted Orion, I can say, oh, just look at the star that's to the top right-hand side of Orion. I can use it to point to other ones. I can then identify other shapes in the sky, pattern the whole sky, and then we can spot the ones that don't fit into the patterns, that break it, the ones that we now call planets. And furthermore, we can then put all of those together, watch them go across the sky, and we can use them to navigate round the world. That's what we did before the invention of the compass in about 1300. The only way of getting round the world was by looking at those patterns. But we don't think they're true. They're just ways of holding the stuff. So the way we hold the world doesn't have to be true in order for it to be fantastically useful. Now, I, uh, I put forward together this theory, which is from a philosophical theory, some 20 years ago. It was called closure. And since then, one of the intriguing things for me that's happened is that neuroscience has started to come to the same conclusion. Figures like David Eagleman, who's a neuroscientist at Stanford, and Donald Hoffman, who is a cognitive scientist at the University of California, Irving, who also incidentally gave a talk here a couple of years ago, um, they have come to the conclusion that the brain, when you look at the way that the brain processes work, they don't describe some stuff out there, that they create these models on the basis of which we intervene in the world. And indeed, David Eagleman has said, reality is an illusion. So I think we have to recognize that this initial thought that our ideas don't reflect the ultimate stuff out there, which initially seems absurd, we have more and more uh, reason to think like this. And it applies for the whole of human knowledge. It applies to every aspect, to all of the things that we might know, where the, how the universe began, where how culture is divided, and so forth. They are ways, they are tools to enable us to make sense of the uh, world. And we change these very radically without uh, it being a disaster. So we've currently got a model of the universe, uh, something about the Big Bang. You will have been taught these sorts of things at school and the standard model and, and so forth. Well, recently, we've identified that when we use these models, it doesn't seem to match up with what happens. And so we've had to create new bits. We've had to invent new bits of what I would call closure to try and get that model to work in the form of dark energy and dark matter. And we just tacked it on. We've got no evidence for the dark matter or dark energy other than we just need to do something to our model to get it to work. And so we've just added them on and saying, well, this might be a solution. But these aren't minor changes. Dark energy and dark matter account for 95% of the matter in the universe. 
in the last 20 or 30 years, we've, we've just found 95% of the universe, according, according to contemporary science. It doesn't stop our previous account being useful and enabling us into a vein. And it doesn't mean that as a result, we have to think, oh, well, it's all, no, there's no point to any of this. It's just that they are tools. They are tools to help us make sense of the world. And we modify those tools and we add to them and we invent bits in order to get the tool to work better. And they are not approaching the truth. It's not as, oh, now, now we've worked out, okay, there really is this stuff, dark matter. No, no, no. We've got a model. And the model works better if we uh, imagine that there is something which is dark matter, if we hold the world like that. Some of you may be a little bit convinced by this, but many of you may also think, well, that's all very well, but I, I'm uncomfortable. I don't, you know, I, I've, I've grown up, I, I had my childhood, I learned all of this stuff in the books, I, I looked at the encyclopedias, I, I've developed my idea of what's going on, and now you tell me, you know, this is just a sort of um, human artifact, that it's not really about stuff in the end, and that's true of everything. And you might understandably think, well, <laughs> I'm scared, I don't want to be lost but another way of thinking about it is that it's not that we are lost, because actually we've always been lost in that sense. No one has ever come up with an account of the universe which lasted for, for any decent length of time without people trashing it. That's how it is. In the whole of human history, we've never arrived. We're never going to arrive. You know that, really, don't you? You know that already. But you don't draw, we don't usually draw the conclusion of that which is there isn't an arrival to get to. And instead, if you think about this framework that I'm offering you of the world is open and we close it, and those closures enable us to intervene in the world, you can think of this as being liberating and exciting. That it means that all of the alternative ways we have of understanding the world give us new potential to do things. New potential, new horizons, new ways of understanding things which would enable us to intervene better than we do at the moment. And instead, therefore, it being something that we should be fearful of, it's something that offers us potential and which at the same time we can improve on. It's not that we just choose any new framework willy-nilly as if, well, we'll just go with this one, uh, it'll do for the moment. No, we've got to see how it works. We've got to look and see whether if we adopt that framework, it will work out there in the world. So we have to, we don't give up on observation and reason. We need them more than ever. One of the strange things about the postmodern move is that it seems to me it's got everything absolutely upside down in the sense that people still hold often to the idea of truth, but they are skeptical of observation and reason. I, I don't follow this. We need to give up on the idea that our theories might arrive, that we might discover an ultimate reality. But at the same time, we need to uh, use uh, observation and reason to look very carefully at the consequences of holding the world in a particular way and thinking, does that model, does that closure actually work? And if it doesn't, we should change it or use a different one. Now, I'd just like to leave you with a last sort of thought. We, we tend to think of science on the one hand and technology as being down to earth and practical. It delivers useful things for us. It, you know, makes our life easier. It makes, um, you know, cleaning our clothes slightly less drudgery like. Practical. But it does have an arid quality. A sort of, it's just what you see is what you get quality, which some people feel uncomfortable about. And there's another side to the things that engage us, which are perhaps more, more poetic, more artistic, more spiritual. And we think of these as being opposites, the practical stuff and the magical stuff. But I want to suggest to you these are two sides 
of the same coin. The practical stuff is the consequence of closure. We apply a way of closing the world and we try and get it to work and we can refine it and we can use all of our techniques and measurements to try and get it to work better. We can get a faster car. So we can use our uh, practical scientific way of going about things to improve our lives. But at the same time, we can have the sense of the wonder of the world, of a sense that somehow all of these practical ways of doing things don't somehow capture the magic and the extraordinariness of what it is to be alive, which it seems to me under, underlies so much of art and religion. And they're two sides of the same story of closure and openness. They're not in opposition. I think if we give up on the ultimately real, the idea that we might finally get there. A notion, incidentally, I think the ultimately real is a scientific version of God. God had the characteristic that it was ineffable. God was ineffable. You couldn't really ever know God. And so the religious story is somehow we're, we're, we're trying to make sense of it, but we can never arrive. Well, the ultimately real functions, I think, exactly the same way with science. It's a theological notion, truth. It's a theological notion. And if we give up on that, I think we can both make sense of trying to make the world a better place by refining our models and accounts of it, and we can keep the wonder and magic at the world at the same time. And just one last thought for you. We're used to the idea that um, in our various endeavors in knowledge, in philosophy and science, that there are deep puzzles. So in philosophy, you know, there's a puzzle about uh, the nature of consciousness, or there's a puzzle about the nature of things, or of morality, or whatever it be. And in science, there's a puzzle about what came before the Big Bang, or what is the structure of uh, force, or where do we uh, determine the laws of uh, the universe? And we usually think of these puzzles as being somehow problems, unexpected difficulties. And I'd like to suggest to you that, that they're, not, they're not surprising at all. Our, 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 our models, our closures of the world, will always fail because they're not the same thing as the stuff out there. They're infinitely different. And therefore, the closer we look at them, the more we can identify the bits that don't work. And that's why whatever framework you have, you get problems. That's why wherever you look, there are cracks in the theory. And so the cracks in, the th in our theories are not unexpected gaps. They are inevitable gaps. If we plug the gap in contemporary science at the moment with, um, uh, with dark matter and dark energy, There'll be new gaps, won't there? There'll be gaps about, well, how is it formed? Uh, where do these things really come from? And we imagine that somehow we can keep on adding and get to the end, but we can't. We'll never get to the end. There are always going to be those puzzles, and those puzzles, those cracks, are potential for us. They're the potential for us to find another way of thinking about it, a different closure, a different <laughs> constellation that would enable us to understand the world in a way which enable us to achieve things we can't achieve at the moment and make, hopefully, the world a little bit of a better place. Thank you. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.